Welcome. Thank you for making Hemp Day Hemp Day. I'm Robert Colangelo, Hemplet Farms, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. Hemplet Farms is a high-tech propagation company, and we provide high-quality seedlings and clones to uh, hemp farmers. We develop these webinars to exchange reliable, trustworthy information and share our experiences with like-minded professionals in the Midwest hemp community so that we can all prosper in this new emerging market. This is a volunteer effort and a labor of love, and it's been led by Christian Lee here at Hemplifit Farms and our team, Marguerite Bolt at Purdue University Extension Services, and Jamie Campbell with the Midwest Hemp Council. Today, we have one of the uh, hardest working hemp extension specialists in the business, and uh, we're very happy to have our own Marguerite Bolt uh, share her uh, experience in the industry. As a hemp extension spec specialist, she has a unique vantage point. She really sees many aspects of the entire hemp market. And she's gonna provide an overview of what Indiana hemp growers experienced during the 2020 growing season and what we may expect for the 2021 season. So without further ado, Marguerite Bolt. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for all the kind words. Um, I'm excited to share with you some of the survey data um, that I just got at the end of last week. So I haven't gotten through all of the responses yet. There's seven, I think 76 questions to go over, but I wanted to give you an overview of some of the important things we saw in 2020. I'll make some comparisons between 2019 because um, we did have different issues between the two years. And then kind of talk about what I think is gonna happen in 2021, and what I expect to see. Um, so let's get started. So for Indiana hemp production last year, um, this is just a figure of the percentage of dedicated type of hemp produced in Indiana. So in that large blue pie, uh, that is hemp for CBD grown from seed specifically. Uh, and then in this large orange pie, we have hemp grown for CBD from clones or cuttings. So you can see that is the majority of production in the state of Indiana. Um, and that'll become important. One of my last few slides talking about what we expect to see in the future. Um, but we still have hemp for, for oil or for grain production um, and then hemp for fiber as well. So still producing all three kinds in Indiana. So when we look at when hemp was planted in 2019, 72% was planted in June and July and about 68% was harvested in September and October. Um, because CBD dominates the hemp landscape in Indiana and elsewhere. This isn't that surprising. Um, there are a couple of reasons why we see later July plantings that I'll go over, but this is kind of the window we see when you're transplanting a crop um, and then harvesting it in that September, October, fall timeframe. This year or this past year, um, similar results, 71% planted in June and July, 72% harvested in September and October. Um, but when I mentioned, you know, that later planting, July planting, um, there are two very different reasons why we saw those later plantings between 2019 and 2020. So in 2019, the biggest reason we saw delays in planting was due to weather. Um, for a refresher, it was one of the wettest years, I think, in the last hundred years in Indiana. So fields that were completely flooded, growers could not actually get equipment into the field. If they could, they ran the risk of having plants um, die from just soil saturation with water. And it was not a good situation. Um, so that was the main driver for that, you know, later July planting. But in 2020, we see that the response due to weather um, is all over the board. You know, a small percentage said, yes, they agree. Um, some said strongly disagree. It's just pretty evenly distributed in the actual responses. So. Why do we actually see that? If weather wasn't a big issue, why do we see still June to late July plantings? Um, so there are a couple of reasons that I've found from this. Um, some delayed planting due to COVID possibly. Um, I had talked to some growers that decided, you know, maybe they do wanna plant, maybe they don't. So that caused a delay in that set date uh, out in the field. Maybe they couldn't find labor because of COVID. Um, there are just some challenges related to, you know, a pandemic shutting everything down. Uncertainty in the market. Um, again, growers going back and forth deciding if they want to put the money into hemp production with prices that decrease so severely over a two-year period. Uh, and then 
Another reason, um, and this is based on management, is growers wanting to set their plants later. Um, so this has to do with being able to actually manage the crop. If you, for many of you that know, uh, hemp plants get to get very, very tall. And if you set too early, those plants may reach a size that is just unmanageable. Um, for example, I saw plants this past season planted in early May that were around nine feet tall on average. And these are CBD specific plants. So you could see that'd be very difficult to actually manage and harvest a crop like that. Um, so, you know, even though yield could be greater, um, the amount of time you spend harvesting, maybe you have to harvest in a different way that's more expensive, um, just makes it not manageable to plant that early. One of the problems though, with some of these delayed plantings and going back and forth, am I gonna plant, am I gonna not plant, is you, some growers received plant material, had a delay, and then they have root bound starts like in this photo. So you can see the roots are starting to wrap. Um, this is particularly bad because this is in round cells. So you just see a lot of spiraling of those roots. Um, but what happens when those plants get set is you can have a situation like this. This is a later season plant that actually um, died. And this was sent to me from an extension educator who's working with a grower. Um, so these plants were set with those you know, root bound and then we have root girdling later in the season. And what happened with this particular grower is it was a combination of root girdling and then having a rainfall event. And there was water just kind of sitting around the roots and then infection from uh, Fusarium pathogen. So it's kind of a double hitter of the plants were already weak because they were root bound and then they got uh, disease and eventually it killed um, quite a few plants in this operation. Here's some numbers on crop destruction. Um, so for CBD growers who are the majority that make up crop destruction reports, um, about 20% of hemp tested or hemp fields tested last year um, were issued a destruction report. The previous year, about 35% um, tested hot or were above the compliance threshold of 0.3% THC. Um, this is pretty comparable to neighboring states. It really falls in line 30% down to 20% range. So why the decrease? Um, one of the big things that I've seen is self-monitoring through testing. So we ask growers, did you do independent testing of your hemp? And 88% did. And I think that, you know, had a big impact on timing of harvest, um, figuring out maybe which varieties they want to grow in the future based on testing results. So maybe they harvested early because they were reaching that threshold. And then next year they're going to, or this year rather, they're going to know, maybe I don't want to grow that vodka variety. So this 20% may decrease to 15%. Um, so we're hopeful that a combination of self-monitoring and narrowing down of suitable or lower risk um, performing varieties is going to help decrease you know, the amount of hemp that is gonna actually get destroyed in 2021. We're still having issues um, though when it comes to compliant crops. One of the biggest things that has been confusing, I think for regulators and researchers are discrepancies in naming. Um, so I just pulled up a couple of examples from uh, our internal report that I got from the state chemist. And we can all tell that, you know, this Matterhorn is likely all from the same source. Um, there were some spelling errors when it came to growers actually putting in what they were going to produce. Um, which means they get recorded as separate varieties. Um, and the little bolded and starred um, names that are included here mean they never went hot. Um, no sample went hot. These are average THC content, but it's pretty safe to say that this matter, Matterhorn is probably all the same variety or cultivar. Um, berry blossom is another example where lots of different spelling variations. Um, sometimes it goes hot, sometimes it doesn't. Could depend on seed source. Um, or clone source, but that has caused some issues when it just comes to overall reporting and trying to help growers figure out which varieties are going to be a lower risk for them when it comes to THC. And it seems like for other varieties, um, if it if it isn't a variety that has gone through some AOSCA approval, which is mostly limited to grain and fiber, not always. I know New West Genetics has some CBD that have gone through seed certification. Um, but there are more varieties, more and more that are getting plant patents, but if they don't have those things, it seems to be free game with naming. Um, so that's caused some problems of two varieties that are named differently, like very different. It's not a spelling error, but are performing 
and phenotypically look very, very similar, almost identical. It's like, are those two different varieties or is that just by chance? Um, so that's caused some problems when, as researchers are trying to make recommendations. This is a tool that I would be remiss not to highlight. Um, this is the Midwest Hemp Cannabinoid Database. It's run out of University of Illinois, but it's a collaboration between U of I, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Michigan State University, my alma mater, and Purdue University. So this is a, a free tool. You can look for specific uh, cultivars and specific providers um, across the four different states and look at performance data. So this is just a relationship between CBD and THC um, from this last year based on hundreds of samples that were submitted to a lab in Wisconsin. We'll be running um, this program again this year and we'll be sending out more information on participating as a grower. Um, but this has been one of the greatest tools that we've seen developed when it comes to um, providing free resources to growers to try to figure out you know, some of the lower risk varieties and with a second year of, of data through this database, we'll be able to start to see some of those trends. And again, hopefully that decreases the amount of destruct orders that go out. We've also had some problems um, with seeds and seed quality. Um, and I just gave an update about this to our extension educators. So if you work with any of them, you probably um, will be hearing about this as well. And Don Robeson recently put an article out about this. So this is kind of the summary. Um, but some of the big issues we've seen that I'm hoping are better in 2021, um, paying for seed that doesn't show up. I almost had a problem with this with the provider um, that eventually just went out of business. So I didn't pay, but I also didn't get any seed. Um, poor quality seed, germination, purity, um, you know, weed seeds present is a problem. And then labeling. Labeling is still a problem. I pulled this off a Facebook group that I found. Um, it's not anybody from Indiana. Uh, but this kind of labeling where it's just the name on a little jar is not a true seed label. Um, and so that can cause a lot of confusion about uh, what a grower is purchasing, what a certificate of analysis looks like, what the germination of that seed is. So again, this is not a true seed label. I'd be wary of this. Um, and I'm surprised that I am still seeing this because I remember when I first started my position, this was pretty common. Um, Avery printed labels with just the name, um, but it's still, still happening. So one of the reasons we're seeing this again, hemp, even though we're so involved in it and we're passionate about it, it still is a new industry. It's still developing um, pretty rapidly. And unfortunately there are people that wanna take advantage of this and take advantage of growers. Um, which obviously I hate to see, uh, but it happens. And it naturally will kind of run its course and hopefully those kind of bad players continue to, to leave the industry. Um, there's also inexperienced breeding operations, um, which can cause some instability in genetics that growers are getting. Um, and then there's so many providers to sort through. Um, in Indiana, there are 82 Indiana seed permit holders. This doesn't mean they're all producing unique genetics. This could mean they're just distributing for a company, but it can be incredibly confusing to sort through and say, who do I want to work with? Who shouldn't I work with? Um, but this is something that, again, I think over time, they'll probably narrow down to a smaller group of, of permit holders. So to prevent this, um, again, seed labels are really important. State chemists put together a great um, resource free resource going over the components of a seed label, including this uh, sample label you see here. Um, for people who are looking to purchase hemp directly um, from some of these seed permit holders, you know, it does provide some protection because they must abide by the regulations within the state, which means having that seed label means saying, you know, what is the percentage purity of hemp? What kind of noxious weeds are present? What's the germination? In hemp's case, what's the THC content um, at maturity, not in the seed? Um, so this provides some protection for growers. And then it also provides protection for these distributors or breeders uh, because you can include as a seed permit holder, hey, there's a plant patent on this and a grower cannot take cuttings. They cannot take genetic material and hold it over, um, which is common in a lot of other crop systems. So, you know, it does provide protections to both entities. Um, and if there is a problem, the state chemist can kind of act like a mediator between the two parties. Um, and 
the state chemist has been, in my opinion, a, a great group to work with, and we've had a really nice collaborative relationship. So when growers have a problem, if they go directly to the state chemist and it's a seed problem, they're going to look into it and figure it out since they are the state seed lab. <clears throat> So on to some fiber details. Um, I'm just going to go over yields really quick since this is the minority of what is produced. Um, but here's some beautiful photos of hemp fiber produced in Indiana. So last year, I threw this one up here um, just to give you a comparison for this yield. Um, and I think this is the only one I do it for. But fiber biomass yield, most of it was less than five tons per acre, but we did have a couple like really great players that produced a ton of biomass. Um, in 2020, everything was below five tons per acre. Um, I'm not exactly sure why this is at this point, if it had to do with genetics, delayed planting, which means they're just not going to grow as tall, you won't get as much biomass. Um, but that's kind of what we see for fiber stock yield in 2020, less than five tons per acre. We have, again, the min minority of hemp is going into grain production. Um, in Indiana, but our grain growers tend to always have homes uh, for their grain at time of harvest. So this is just 2020 yield. Um, we kind of have a distribution, nice distribution between what the yields looked like um, with the majority percentage in the 401 to 700 pounds per acre. Um, some of the growers producing above 700 pounds per acre and when you know you talk to growers about this maximized yield, it's usually around a thousand pounds breaker range, which is getting into that kind of Canadian standard of above a thousand pounds um, of hemp grain per acre. One of the problems um, that some of you may be aware of when you produce grain in Indiana is we're working with genetics from other countries. So latitudes that differ. We don't have the, in Canada's case, several decades worth of experience in production. Um, so yields will eventually catch up for anybody that's interested in the grain sector. And then CBD, the majority of production, which also has the most diversity when we look at production models in the state of Indiana, from bare ground, raised beds in plastic, to raised beds and living covers between rows. Um, we see a lot of different methods that are produced. Um, and when the 2020 season report gets published to the state chemist website, you'll get to see, you know, what grow, how many growers laid plastic, did they use irrigation, raised beds, information like that. So we'll start to see kind of trends in production. Um, but at this point, a lot of growers are still figuring out what works best for their specific operation. So for CBD hemp yield last year, most growers in just biomass, so pounds per acre alone, produced less than 500 pounds per acre or that 500 to 1,000 pounds per acre. So I'd say that's probably lower than what growers are shooting for. Um, if we look at a standard being a pound of dried biomass, hopefully a pound of dried biomass per plant, um, and then 1,500 plants per acre, that would put you at the 1,500 pounds per acre um, or potentially higher. Uh, however, I know working with lots of different genetics, we do see decreases in yield overall, maybe a half a pound of dried material uh, per plant. Maybe there's some plant mortality out in the field. So you started with 1500 plants or 2000 plants and you had a disease outbreak or you had a low area of the field and the plants died from flooding um, or you had pest damage in a specific area and they really chewed on those, uh, those buds that were developing. So, you know, I think again, over time as we start to figure out high performing varieties that have a lower risk of THC, we'll hopefully see kind of a bump up of that overall yield per acre. When we look at CBD content, um, I don't have the 2020, 20, excuse me, 2019 figure up here, um, but it's almost an exact mirror of this with the majority producing six to 9%, um, some producing over 10%, and that might just be 10.5% or 11%, or if they produced 16% CBD, it's likely almost certain that they had a, a destruct order, or they were above the THC threshold. Um, so most growers, kind of in that range. Um, we're seeing that hold over a two year period. Um, the big difference though this year is about 50% of growers uh, saw seed set in their CBD crop. So there was pollen floating somewhere, whether it was in their field or a neighboring field. This year, the majority of growers said, no, they didn't see seed. Um, so maybe a six to 9% content is more related to, 
you know, having to harvest early so they couldn't maximize um, the actual CBD they thought they would be able to get. Just on that note, if we have any new to hemp people that didn't know this, hemp's wind pollinated. It produces really small pollen grains um, that are very good at moving through the air on ourselves. Um, bees and other pollinators really like to collect the pollen. And while they're not visiting female flowers for the nectar, um, that doesn't mean that they don't rest on a female flower for whatever reason or collect some of those plant resins for propolis. Um, so there's just a lot of ways for pollen to move around. Um, corn and wheat are other good examples of wind pollinated crops um, found in the Indiana landscape. So this is important to consider um, when choosing your field sites. I always say it's good to know your neighbors when you're a hemp grower in general, because uh, we've had some disputes between neighbors not liking that. You know, the farmer across the road from them is growing hemp. It smells bad. They think it's going to bring crime. I mean, all kinds of things. So I'd say it's good to just know your neighbor in general to try to reduce some of these conflicts. Um, but also, you know, if you get to know your neighbors and you say, hey, I know somebody down the road that's growing hemp um, and now you're growing hemp and, you know, maybe they're growing grain and you're doing CBD. And so that are those are two conflicting uh, types of production because grain produces a lot of uh, a lot of pollen. So it's just good to have an open channel of communication. Wind breaks are another option that I think could reduce um, pollen movement. Maybe this means, you know, you choose a field that is surrounded by trees. I know some growers have planted within corn fields, mostly for privacy, but considering windbreaks, especially in parts of Indiana that are very, very flat. Um, and then feral hemp is also a source of pollen. Um, so especially for northern growers, you know, if you have feral hemp along your fence line, maybe that means removing that. Um, you can't get every population, right, because it's all over but at least maybe the immediate feral hemp you can remove or ask your neighbor to remove theirs. This is just, I, I brought this up when I gave this talk about a year ago, um, but this is a free map that actually has all of the cannabis that has been reported. Um, it's an invasive species map, which is kind of funny, um, but cannabis is one of the species you can look for. Um, and so all the green counties have reports of cannabis. However, this also could mean somebody that was growing high THC cannabis that was found by someone scouting for this, um, you know, survey service. So it doesn't mean that it's necessarily feral hemp, um, but in the northern counties, it's pretty prevalent all over. Um, same thing with Illinois and Wisconsin and southern Michigan. There are populations all over there, but this is a free tool. Um, that you can access and look for populations. I wouldn't suggest going and collecting um, any wild cannabis plants, uh, but it gives you a heads up if you're in one of these shaded counties. So I'm just gonna take a little break here um, to see if there's any questions. So uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, send them to me via the chat function. And while we're waiting for questions, Marguerite, I've got three for you. Can you go to your first slide, please? Uh, yeah. And you may have, I saw a chat thing pop up when I first started, but I can't see them in this mode. So thank you on this, uh, Marguerite, where it shows 43% uh, of the fields were planted for, for se using seed mm -hmm. and uh, 36, that was just CBD. It wasn't grain and, and uh, fiber, correct? Correct. And for the CBD from seed, that could have been interpreted as direct seeding because we do see that. Um, I've seen a couple of fields direct seeded CBD, or it could mean transplant planting seedlings. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then the hemp for oil, even though I know there's a lot of confusion between seed oil and CBD oil, that would be true oil seed hemp. Um, so just to. Okay. If you could go it. to the slide that says THC versus CBD, mm -hmm. I think it was by University of Illinois. Yes. All right, great. So the threshold's 0.3%. There's a mm -hmm. lot of talk about raising uh, th the threshold of THC to 1%, um, which would uh, uh, really help, I think, on the genetics. When I talk to a lot of breeders, they find it a real challenge to breed uh, hemp with that low uh, THC threshold and keep those ratios. Uh, any comments or thoughts on that, on whether we, you think we'll see a 1% uh, THC threshold 
and how that may help the uh, uh, maybe increased percentages of CBD? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a, a congressional decision that's going to depend on what lawmakers want. Um, but I am hopeful, at least through the final rule, that they went in and took our comments into consideration, raising negligent violation from 0.5% THC to 1%. So if you're a grower and you produce hemp that's 0.9% THC, you still have to destroy it, but you don't get a negligent violation. So that was to me a pretty good signal that at least USDA is saying, hey, we realize how difficult this is. And so we're gonna make this kind of regulatory change, but it ultimately they're not gonna be the ones or can be the ones that change the, the overall THC threshold from 0.3 to 1%. But there's a lot of talk about it. Um, I think Rand Paul's hemp bill that he was introducing included a raise to 1%. On the breeding side, you're exactly right, Robert. It would open up a lot of opportunities for really high producing CBD hemp, things that produce 20% CBD. I mean, that that's a huge difference when you look at processing. I mean, that is just going to be a, a higher value. Um, one of the kind of down, potential downsides of that that I've thought about and has been brought up in the past is if you, as a grower, can produce something instead of 10% CBD, it's 20% CBD, you don't need to produce as much to meet the needs of the processor. So does that mean that overall production acres will actually go down because you can just produce so much more CBD per individual plant? So it's yes. kind of a, it's a, yeah, it's a back and forth. Of course, we don't want growers to lose all of the money and time they've put into a crop through destruction, but with that change, it may mean just less producers in general. So it's kind of a, a back yeah, and your, your, your uh, crop, your acreage may go down, but your profitability goes up. Mm -hmm. um, if I just, without quantifying this chart from my observations, it looks like about a third of those uh, points are above that 0.3%. But you can see uh, just how much the uh, CBD percentages increase as you go up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I really hope we get to that 1% threshold. Um, next, uh, last question is if you go to the uh, so slide with the seed labeling. And you've got great slides oh. here, Marguerite. I think it's this way. There. there. This one? So, okay. A couple of things that I see absent here is one, there's no info on the age of the seed on this. And a question that I have for you that I have not been able to get uh, a clear answer on is what is the shelf life of seed? Oh, yes. So the lot number referring to this would likely be a good place to start for where, when the, the seed was produced because the lot should be associated with a specific like yield or harvest. Um, so the company should be able to provide you that. But I would say a year is a good shelf life if it's stored properly. I've had personal experience planting hemp seed that's two or three years old, and it's been stored properly, but you just do see a decrease in germination overall and quality. Um, so new seed is always better. Um, some seed providers, when you sign any kind of material transfer agreement or buying agreement, they say you can't hold over seed, um, which is true with a lot of crops, especially any kind of like genetically modified crop. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, too, is read those agreements to see what is in there, because uh, that's a legally binding contract. So for, for some of the seed with we've worked with, you know, it says you have to destroy excess seed you have left over. Um, from the initial purchase after, you know, the field season. Um, so, so what we're seeing that we have a big concern about is that a lot of the uh, seed breeders have overproduced and undersold. So there's now uh, a couple of years of seed in inventory. And, you know, I've heard somewhere between six months to a year is a safe, uh, you know, time to be able to store seed if it's stored at the right temperature and humidity. So I just give that concern to, to people out there. Um, and again, you might be able to tell by the lot size, but it, but I still think there's some ability to uh, uh, make it a little uh, difficult to tell exactly what year that was grown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I, uh, how come you have a germ rate, but you don't have a feminization rate? Yeah, so that isn't a requirement 
um, for seed labeling at this point that I've seen from hemp. The THC is a requirement, which I don't think is on this one that they have. This is a couple years old, but it is a yep. requirement to include THC. Um, but feminization is something that we've heard back and forth about requiring it on there. I would say good providers will include that anyway. And I, as if I was growing some feminized seed, I would demand it. Um, and I'd be really weary, wary of anybody who didn't provide that information. Um, Great. Oh, go ahead. That's, yeah, that's one of the challenges too with feminization is, you know, method of feminization. Do we make them include that as well? Um, it just, it becomes kind of murky. And at this point, especially with these seed certifying agencies, um, trying to figure out how we move hemp through seed certification process, feminization would be something that would need to be included for that. But right now, it's just kind of a, it's just changing so fast. I think it's difficult to, to get a handle on all yeah. of the requirements. All right. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. If you have any others uh, for Marguerite, please uh, send them to me using the chat function. And uh, did you need to take a, a sip of water or are you ready to go to the next uh, yeah, presentation? <laughs> I got my sip of water and I'll move on to some challenges and then some of the kind of wrap up things I've noticed and what we can expect. Um, so site selection, I always bring this up in my talks because it continues to be a problem. It's just poor site selection and just making sure everyone knows just because you can grow hemp anywhere doesn't mean you should. Um, you know, selecting a site where you're going to optimize your yield is really important. Um, one of the things we saw this year, and we've seen it in past years, but Fusarium was really common. Um, we got a lot of reports into our diagnostic lab. Um, and it really had to do with site selection and inoculum in the soil. Um, white mold is another one that I think I saw some reports from irrigation and soybeans this last year and white mold was a problem more so for some of the soybean growers as well. So I heard um, a lot of problems with some of these diseases that really have to do with proper site selection and understanding the history of the field. And this is an example of a site where we grow hemp every year at the research farm for sp space reasons and every year it ends miserably because we always get a rainfall event that causes this standing water, which hemp does not like. Pests and pesticide issues have rapidly evolved like much many things in this industry. Um, but now I think when I gave this talk a year ago, we didn't have any products available. Um, now we do. Not only do we have the 25 uh, B products, which aren't included here, the, the minimum risk products, we have section three EPA registered products. And then we have what we call special local needs products um, that are specific to the state of Indiana, um, but many neighboring states also have lists like this. Um, we observed downy mildew for the first time in Indiana. Um, so that was something we were expecting to see at some point. Um, this mainly because Wisconsin had started to see some problems and we finally saw it. Um, and then common stock borer was one that was pretty isolated to specific field sites, but I had never seen that in hemp um, and we saw it here and in Iowa. So new, new pests and diseases are just gonna constantly be observed uh, in hemp as we learn more about the crop and have more growers and spend more time in the field. Um, but with a list of products, um, comes, you know, some efficacy trials, understanding if these really are going to work for the pest and pathogen problems that we're seeing, but it is a step in the right direction that we at least have products, um, you know, softer chemistries, OMRI listed products, which isn't a bad thing because usually they interact well with biological organisms. Um, but it means EPA is actually understanding that hemp is a real crap. And so it has real issues we need to address. Sorry, my dog is very, very loud. Midge! I can wait a second, Robert. I'm sorry. She's That's okay to add some color to the presentation. Yeah, she's something. Maybe she needs some CBD. Yeah, I think she sees the neighbor dogs and she gets very excited. Midge, and she's named after an insect, a midge, <laughs> which can be sometimes a pesty, pesky pest insect. Um, <laughs> oh, 
Okay. I think she's starting to wear herself out. Um, so we asked growers in the survey some of the commonly observed diseases that they saw in hemp. And one of the things that's very challenging about um, identifying what diseases growers are seeing is a lot of them can look or present similar symptoms. Um, so for, for growers who really want to understand and, and truly identify what they're seeing, um, they can send samples into the plant diagnostic lab, and then you can get a definitive answer of what you're actually seeing. Um, but we did see some root rots, pythium um, in that top left photo, and then a lot of unknowns. Um, it could be root rot, it could just be mortality in general, um, but hemp is kind of a weak like baby seed and it needs lots of love and care, um, but it also means it's pretty susceptible to lots of different root rots. Foliar diseases, our, our biggest reported foliar disease um, was powdery mildew. That's that top right photo. Um, and then cercospora leaf spot. But there are lots of leaf spots that I'll show in a second, um, which means they don't always get identified as the, the accurate one or correct one. Um, and then bud rot or bud blast. We don't know if this is botrytis. White mold also causes a bud rot um, that can look similar. Sometimes mechanical damage from insects can cause secondary infection. Um, so again, sending samples in for identification is a good way to say for sure what it is, and then we can better pick products to, to manage specific diseases. So I mentioned lots of foliar diseases. Um, we see cercospora and foma leaf spot. I see foma, which is that yellow pointed uh, lesion right there. That's super common. I see it all over the research farm. Um, there's a leaf spot that's called hemp leaf spot, which also looks very similar and is really common, um, especially in Kentucky. And I think it's causing yield loss, but again, it's very challenging because we're just in the beginning stages of being able to identify um, what the disease manifestations really look like, what the symptoms look like in the hemp plants. Some other ones, again, powdery mildew. Um, we see that one indoors and outdoors. Rust is one we found the last uh, couple years. So an extension educator in Montgomery County, Ashley Adair has found it. And then I've also found it up in LaPorte County. Um, so up in Northern Indiana. And then viruses, hemp is uh, susceptible to viruses. I don't think we've identified any through our diagnostic lab, but I have been, made aware that um, hemp latent viroid is causing a lot of problems out in Western states. And we need to just be aware that it could become problematic here. And maybe it is already here affecting hemp um, and we just haven't been actually testing for it. So hemp can get lots of diseases. Um, for anybody that's new and hasn't grown, you'll see. Um, and then we also ask commonly observed insects. So corn earworm, uh, is the most common seed or, or flower head uh, chewing insect. That's that top left photo. This one's tricky because it comes in so many different color morphs. This is a green one. Um, sometimes we see ones that are green with pink spots on the side or brown or kind of gray, more yellowish, um, but it is really common. It's just a common pest in Indiana in general. We have European corn borer, which in that photo in the top right, it's starting to form its pupa. Um, this is another one that, again, it's in the landscape. It seems to like hemp all right. Um, so we see it in the plant, growers observe it. Um, yellow striped armyworm, which is that kind of hidden caterpillar right there. Um, this is the most common leaf feeder. And I saw this one a lot this year and I'd recorded it in hemp in previous years, but it was just very abundant. It must've been the right conditions or people were looking for it more. I mean, it's pretty flashy with those two yellow stripes. Um, but again, this is one that it's around and hemp is there and it's sometimes the only green crop um, amid a sea of browning plants. So it just seems like a, a attractive host. And then cannabis aphid is another one. Um, it's a fluid sucking pest. When we ask growers these questions, it includes our indoor and outdoor growers. Um, and this is a pest that we see in both types of grow settings. Um, you can see on this particular leaf, there's lots of little cannabis aphids hanging out. But what's really cool about cannabis aphid is there are biological control agents or predators um, and parasitoids in the environment that provide some control. Um, so our most observed beneficial insect are ladybugs or lady beetles, um, which look like little tiny black and orange alligators um, when they're in their larval form. And they are pretty big eaters. They really like aphids and other squishy, soft-bodied insects and mites. 
Um, so we often will see a big population of lady beetles when we have a large population of um, cannabis aphids. So pretty cool to see that just occurring out in the field. Um, corn earworm is one I like to bring to light just because it is common in the environment. We do have a trapping network that's featured here and we have products available. Um, but scouting your plants, um, not just for insects, but for diseases and to make weed management decisions is really important. Um, and it's really important when you're considering your application of products. So a lot of these um, biological based products, uh, in the case of corn earworm, there are viruses and bacteria and toxins derived from bacteria available. Um, they are most effective when you have tiny caterpillars. So on the left, um, that's a really small corn earworm larva compared to the one on the right. Um, so those earlier life stages of the caterpillar are just gonna be way more susceptible to these products. So that's why scouting is really, really important going out when the plants are vulnerable. So when they're producing these flowers or for grain growers, the, the seed heads and looking for this pest. Um, like I said, the, you can see they come in different colors, um, but in general they have, you know, kind of spiky hairs, a little Y shape on their, um, the front of their head. And it's one that I would say, get, get used to observing and identifying. Jada leafhopper is one that wasn't commonly observed, but can cause a lot of damage. You can see these plants have um, some scorching or yellowing at the tips of the leaves or starting to curl. I've seen plants that their growth has been severely stunted due to this pest. Um, and this is where site selection is important in understanding neighboring crops. Um, so maybe don't plant your hemp right next to an alfalfa field, which is also a very susceptible crop to potato leaf hopper. And last year, 2020 was, I think one of the worst potato leaf hopper years on record. Um, what most people don't know is this is a migratory species. So they actually come up from the Southern US. And when we have mild winters and then warm springs and summers, we can see greater populations. Um, so we're hopeful we'll find some resistant or tolerant uh, hemp that isn't gonna show this kind of damage. Um, but again, field site selection is important for a lot of different reasons. And then something that I did, which is kind of a, a independent project was scouting of Indiana ditchweed or feral hemp. So this is a photo from one of the sites. Um, these are kind of leftover genetics from fiber production in the state of Indiana. Um, so they get really tall. They're usually on field margins. I found them on the edge of woodlots. Um, but I went and scouted ditchweed. I went and looked at when plants emerged, which was March 29th, which is very early. They got hit by multiple frosts and still grew. Um, some of the seed just didn't germinate as early, so they weren't hit by that. But even ones that did have frost damage seemed to kind of recover. Um, and then I looked for what we call EHB or Eurasian hemp borer. So I was trying to understand when do they emerge, how many generations do they have, which is very difficult to determine with this pest because they overlap. Um, so I don't have that answer, but I found adults in early May and then I found larvae in June. Um, so we're seeing adults come out, they're pupating in the early spring and then emerging and then mating um, and then laying eggs and those eggs hatch into larvae which bore into the plants. I mean, it is a hemp borer um, and it causes problems later in the season. So it's one, again, especially if you're near ditchweed populations or in one of those counties, this is a pest that can move from feral hemp into commercially produced hemp. So there's some close-ups of that pest. Um, it's kind of a pinky cream color. And then later in the season, it turns later generations uh, turn more of an orange hue and actually overwinter in the stalk um, with that kind of pink or orange larval form. Um, so they don't pupate in the soil as far as we think. They don't form their pupae in the stems. They're in there as uh, just mature larvae waiting to pupate in the spring. And um, I've gone out in the winter months and collected uh, larval samples. So they're definitely out there. Uh, and then there's a picture of an adult moth. They're very tiny um, little, little insects. And then for indoor producers, I mentioned growers are seeing cannabis aphid indoors, but we see typical greenhouse pests. So spider mites or white flies, Cannabis aphid, not so typical, but for, for cannabis it is. And then hemp russet mite, which I haven't personally observed, um, but I know it's out there. Um, but the nice thing about having indoor production is if you know what pests you're expecting to see, you can implement integrated pest management plans. You can look at biological control releases, especially for things like 
cannabis aphid and mites, there are commercially available options that may be an effective choice. Before I move on to my last section talking about weed management, um, here are some of the beneficial insects that I commonly hear about and I've seen out in the field. So we have our lady beetles making more lady beetles. So they're happy to be on the hemp eating those cannabis aphids. Praying mantis are one of the, I think, most exciting insects that growers see. I hear and get pictures all the time. Um, they hang out on the plants. They really like to eat lots of different insects, uh, kind of a generalist in what they consume. And then we have lacewings. Um, so these also look like strange little alligators um, and they eat sm small soft bodied insects um, and mites out in the field. Um, and some species of lacewings are commercially available for indoor production. Um, so this is one that, yep, it does fine on the plant and it may offer some biological control commercially. For cannabis aphid, um, I mentioned a Christian I'd show a parasitized aphid. I have more in a folder, um, but this is actually a, a parasitized aphid or a, a mummy um, in that top left photo. They get all bloated and uh, a wasp larva actually develops inside of that aphid um, and then eventually pupates and emerges. And that bottom photo is the wasp that emerged from that aphid. Um, so this is happening just naturally out in the field. We didn't release any kind of biological control agents. Um, we just have it happening on its own, which is really exciting to see um, because hemp, again, hasn't been planted in this area uh, for a very long time. So it's exciting to see that move movement. Um, and then I mentioned pollen. Hemp produces a lot of pollen for grain and fiber, and we see lots of bees. So honeybees in the top photo, little green sweat bees in the bottom photo, we see lots of bumblebees. Um, so if you ever get the opportunity to go out into a grain and fiber field, um, or if you've been to Purdue Field Day in July or August, we tend to have pollen flowing and you can observe bees, um, which is really fun for bee enthusiasts. If you don't like them, not so great, because <laughs> um, they're just all over these plants. Lastly, I'll move to weeds. Um, I didn't put it last because it's not important. Weed management is actually probably one of the largest um, concerns for growers and really having a lack of products um, for weed management has been a problem for some. But these are some of the different weeds that were observed in hemp fields um, last year as a, or in 2019, it was about the same. Velvet leaf, giant ragweed, pigweed, giant foxtail, and then growers seeing things like Johnson grass, purslane is another really common one, um, morning glory, glory, which wraps up on the plants, which can be problematic um, for fiber growers and grain growers because it binds the plants together. Um, so all kinds of different weeds out in the field that we see in Indiana in general. So one of the, the problems we have is that hemp is a slow growing plant when it's direct seeded. Um, so it doesn't necessarily become very competitive in the first couple of weeks, especially if you plant early and it's cool and wet, um, you know, maybe you get a lot of rain events and those weeds come up and the hemp just is kind of a slow grower. But then after that point, it becomes very competitive. So if you can do some weed management control in the beginning of the season, you know, you can have a situation like that top photo where it's clean under the canopy. Um, you have, you know, a clean field besides your hemp. So it's, you know, just something to be aware of. You got to manage early in the season um, to try to see results where you don't have to manage later, where there is an, uh, an effect on your yield. We don't have synthetic herbicides um, labeled for use in hemp. Um, for some, you know, they think that's good. They don't want any herbicide options for hemp. You know, part of hemp being a crop that is environmentally sustainable or they want to see it as this, you know, crop that's going to save the world for a lot of different reasons. They, they don't want to use synthetic products. They don't want that as an available tool. Um, it can be really challenging though for grain and fiber growers who they can't get in with, you know, potentially any kind of mechanical weed weeding equipment like a CBD grower code that has wider row spacing. Um, so that comes down to selecting fields, doing weed management, um, without products, so tilling before, planting cover crops for weed suppression, kind of looking at other tools in the toolbox, which is not a bad thing. Um, but there are two vinegar-based products that are available just really for CBD growers for between row spraying, because it will burn your hemp plants, um, but those are on the EPA list. So hand weeding is common, mechanical weeding devices um, are not as common, but can be used. 
So again, for wider row spacing, you might be able to get in there with cultivation equipment. You can try to control weeds before planting. You can select fields that don't have a history of being really weedy. Um, you can look at previous crop rotations. Maybe you, you know, can control weeds in your other crop because you do have some set synthetic products available. Um, you can do an application, get a good control of your weeds a year or two before, um, and then you can plant hemp. So these are all considerations for weed management, which do take some forethought, um, but it's possible to do. I've seen really clean hemp fields um, without the use of an application during the season. But one of the considerations to make is just carry over, um, you know, having these herbicide residues in the soil and then having them actually affect your hemp, like in this photo, which I don't have an answer of what kind of herbicide causes carryover damage. But there is a tool through University of Wisconsin that looks at label language um, and rotation restrictions. So just if you're going to use that previous crop rotation to your advantage, um, understand, you know, some of the potential carryover risks. But there's limited research in this area. Um, for CBD growers, some processors are going to specifically look for different pesticides present in your material. And some of those include herbicides. So just be aware of that as well um, when selecting your sites. Lastly, just gonna, this is something Robert and I had talked about, about, you know, some of the lack of enthusiasm in the industry and maybe why that is. Um, as many of you know, prices for not only biomass, um, but crude, distillate, isolate has continued to drop. Um, it seems like it may be at a stable point, but it's a really low amount um, compared to when people are really excited getting into growing um, back in early 2019. And growers are still holding on to 2019 and 2020 harvests, not just in Indiana, all over the country. Um, so, you know, some growers might be thinking, what's the point of producing if I'm still holding on to material and I'm not making money? Um, for, you know, some of the people in my position or economists, other people in the industry think that there is likely to be a shift um, to majority grain and fiber production over the next five to 10 years. Um, so enthusiasm may just be shifting to a different group. Um, there'll still be CBD production. I have no doubt about that. Um, but instead of having 70% of acreage dedicated to CBD, that might flip where the majority is dedicated to, to grain and fiber. And this is just you know, a question we asked growers this year and uh, in 2019, but was production profitable? Um, in 2019, about 25% made money, 25% broke even and 50% lost money. We can see that's shifted um, with 68% of people losing money um, in the 2020 growing season. So that could be, you know, a reason for the lack of enthusiasm. Cause again, I think this is probably similar in a lot of other states in the US. So again, that lack of enthusiasm, you know, my thought is maybe part of it is COVID and self-isolation. On um, that bottom photo is from a field day out at the research farm. Um, I know growers and processors and researchers and everyone in between really enjoy those face-to-face -face interactions. Um, and it can be really challenging to constantly get on Zoom. So thank you for being here. Um, but it, it can be exhausting to, to do these kind of digital interactions when we were so used to, you know, taking advantage of in-person meetings and events. Um, and some people that's really paid a toll on them. Um, you know, there's, I'm sure some financial struggles related to the pandemic and the uncertainty in the industry um, that hopefully again, these things kind of, start to get better over the next year. And then policy adjustments. We just had the final rule come out um, through USDA. If you haven't checked that out, I would encourage you to, you don't have to read through the whole thing, but it's good to see what, what some of these changes look like um, and are likely going to change in the state of Indiana as well and other states. Um, but sometimes these adjustments can leave people just exhausted <laughs> from trying to constantly keep up and it's constantly changing. So maybe now that we have at least some stability in rules and regulations from USDA with this implementation of a final rule, then enthusiasm will start to peak. Um, but I wanted to end on this, do you plan to grow in 2021? So we at least had 45% saying definitely yes, I'm gonna grow this year. Um, I'm glad to see that there are still people that wanna produce and are going to, 
Um, you know, 10% are saying probably yes. And then we have, you know, 28% saying maybe that's going to depend, I think, on what policy, these policy changes look like, what the industry does, um, what prices kind of look like. But I'm hopeful that people will, you know, pick up their enthusiasm as planting gets closer. Um, even if they don't grow, I still hope that people want to be involved in the industry in some way. Um, not everybody has to be a grower to provide incredible value. Um, so just keep that in mind if you don't want to grow, but still want to be involved. Um, here is my contact information. I'm going to leave that up for a second um, for anybody who needs it. And then Robert, if there's questions, um, you can go ahead and start asking with the little time we have left. So Marguerite, thank you very much. Uh, that was very content rich and it was very uh, current. And I like what you did, uh, you know, being honest on, on the state of the market. Uh, so I greatly appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, please send them to me using the chat function. Um, I'll, uh, yeah, we're, we're just right about on time here, uh, ending at one o'clock. Um, next month, we're gonna have two speakers from the Midwest Hemp Council, uh, Justin Swanson. Uh, an attorney will provide a policy and a legislative update. And Joe Linney, he's, he's uh, part of the new Hemp Economic Task Force. He's going to share some of the data and information and uh, programs that they're working on. Um, so we will uh, keep a focus on economics as we move forward, because at the end of the day, uh, people have to understand uh, the risk and reward in the marketplace to continue. Um, I don't see any uh, questions uh, as, as we always do. Uh, we will post a, a video of this presentation to the Hemplet Farms website probably sometime early next week. So you can check that. And I thank you all for joining uh, today's session. Uh, I'm Robert Colangelo. Uh, we hope to see you the first Wednesday in March at noon central, uh, where again, we get a chance to make hump day hemp day.